Okay, we're about to go live. When you hop on here, let me know. Also, I have in the description below the worksheet that you need for this live. So make sure you grab that from the link below. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Hey guys, when you hop on here, make sure that you grab the link below. It has the notes in it for tonight. Hey, how's it going? What's up, Ethan and Wen Ying? How's everybody doing? Make sure you grab that link below. Behind me, I have this lovely map for you. Uh, it has the Silk Roads on it and the Indian Ocean trade route and the Trans-Saharan trade route. So make sure and mark that on your notes. Hey, Lady Nadia, this is not a test review. This is just a quick review of some things from Unit 2, including trade routes and how to write an SAQ. That's what we're going to be going over tonight. So we'll get started here in a little bit. While I'm waiting for people to join, go ahead and grab that link down below in the description. That has the notes that we'll be going over tonight. All right, doing good, Wang Ying. That's good. I'm glad. Does anybody have any questions about the Mongol trial while we're uh, getting everybody to download that link below? Anybody got any questions about that? Uh, yes, Dominique, this will be saved. I will be posting it right after the live. So it usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes to upload right after we're done. All right, go ahead and get that link down below. If you'd like to mark these trade routes, on the map in the link that I've given you, that'd be awesome. Ton, how does it work again? Uh, the structure of the trial. Okay, so while you're downloading that link and opening up your Google Doc for tonight's live, I'll go over real quick what you're gonna be doing with the Mongol trial, okay? It's simple. If you have watched Law and Order or any kind of trial show before, that's basically what we're gonna be doing. We're putting Genghis Khan on trial. So depending on your role, let's say you're a witness, you need to find out if your person believes that Genghis Khan is civilized or uncivilized. That's the research that you're going to be doing, okay? So make sure that you find that out about your person. If you are a lawyer, then your role is a little different. You have to figure out how to question those people depending on which side you're on, okay? And we got Rami. Hi, Rami. How's it going? What if you are Khan? Ton, are you Khan? Yay, that's such a cool role. So Genghis Khan, if you are him, you got to know that guy inside and out. Know the bad things he did so that you can defend them and why you did them and know the good things you did so that, you know, you can make yourself look civilized. All right. Uh, Rami says, hey, Ton. <laughs> How's it going, Rami? Uh, Wang Ying, the paragraph is too long. What paragraph? What are you talking about? Uh, Ethan, Genghis Khan would believe he is civil. Yes, he would. He believed that he was in the right, but you have to be able to justify that. Okay. So that's where your research comes in. Uh, let's see. What are some points for the defense to make? Okay. Well, it depends, right? You have to decide as the defense who your witnesses are going to be. So you need to get to know all of the witnesses, okay? Go through all of them and find out, are they on your side? Do they believe that Genghis Khan is uncivilized or do they believe he's civilized, all right? That's what you have to figure out. You have to know those witnesses really well. And then you start formulating questions to ask them, okay? So for example, somebody that would be on the Mongol side would be Mongol women. They would definitely agree that Genghis Khan was civilized. Do you need to know why? And that's where your research comes in, okay? The resources for the research. Yes, you are right, Wang Ying. They, some of them are long. Some of those are scholarly articles, and that's why they're a little bit longer. But listen, you need practice at reading those kinds of things. So what I would suggest is press Control F. It'll bring up a little search box. And then you're going to look for your keywords, okay, that will help you with your research. Let's say you're doing Mongol General. Maybe you want to look for keywords like what kind of weapons they used, things like that, okay? So look for keywords, and then you don't have to read the whole article. You're just reading tidbits to try to get your research out of it, okay? All right. Yes, the answer should be in first uh, person, point of view. That's right, Dominique, because you are becoming that person, okay? 
It's kind of like you stepped into the time machine yourself, all right? You are becoming that person, so definitely put it in first-person point of view. All right, does everybody have the Google document? If so, we're going to get started uh, with what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm so glad you guys have joined in. Basically, we're going to do a quick overview of the trade routes, just review those, and then we're going to talk about how to write an SAQ, okay? How many of you guys struggle with SAQs? They're a little bit challenging sometimes, especially if you don't know the information, because you have to have it very precise and very specific, okay? All right, so we will get you more practice with that SAQ, and you will feel very confident, okay? All right, so, oh, first and foremost, before we get started, wanted to let you guys know I will be doing a live next Tuesday. We'll just cover some things that we haven't had time to cover yet from Unit 2, and then the following Monday, that'll be the night before the test, that's when we'll do a live over the test review, okay, because you'll have a test that week. I think it's like the 22nd or the 21st that we'll be having a test, so we'll have the live the night before that, okay? And I put that schedule in your Google document for you. Oh, also, one opportunity for extra credit is coming your way on Monday. We have a lady from Archaeology Now that's coming to the library. She'll be coming to uh, during lunchtime, and she's going to be talking about Roman hairstyles and how it affected social class. So what you need to do is pack a lunch on Monday, come to the library, you can eat while she's doing the presentation. It's going to be super cool. She's going to have some hair models that she's actually going to be doing some Roman hairstyles on. So you don't want to miss it. Plus, it's extra credit. So that's awesome. Those are the two quick announcements I wanted to make sure you guys knew about. Okay, so looking on your sheet, we're going to talk about the Silk Roads first. Okay, that would be right here, connecting China to the Mediterranean and to Europe, okay? So just basically know this map. You don't necessarily have to know like all the stops along the way, but basically just know kind of the general area of the Silk Road and what it connects, okay? Uh, does the credit work if we have Ms. Johnson's class? Yes, all AP World History teachers, no matter what teacher you have, they're all uh, giving extra credit for the Roman activity that we're doing on Monday, so don't miss it. It is Monday, Dominique, Monday, uh, this coming Monday. And you need to pack a lunch because you won't have time to like go and grab lunch and come in. It starts right pretty soon as the bell rings, okay? So what will happen is you'll come in and I'll have you guys sign a roster of the teacher that you're with. And then that's how you'll get your extra credit. Okay, so let's get going on the Silk Road. You have some vocab. One thing that I think you should do with your vocab that would be super helpful, especially at the end of the year, is to make some flashcards. You know, get those like index cards at the dollar store that are super cheap and put the word on the front and the definition on the back. And then at the end of the year, you'll have a whole year's worth of vocab that you can go through before you take the AP test. So it's a super easy way to study. At the beginning of this sheet, I have some vocab for you to remember. The first one is caravan sarai. Caravan sarai. That's how you say it. And basically what that means is it's an inn along the, the trade route where travelers can trade and rest and replenish. So remember, I told you about the little towns that start springing up along the Silk Road. This is what they're called, or this is the name for it. Actually, it's the name for the inn, okay? So let me tell you that one more time. It's an inn along the trade route where travelers can trade, rest, and replenish. Basically, kind of like a pit stop in their journey, okay? Uh, Henry, the Google Doc is down in the description. Just copy that link and you'll be able to open it up. And you should be able to edit it. Is it not giving you edit permission? Hold on, let me let me see. Let me if I can see if I can fix it. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, true, Tom. Yeah, do that. You can file and then copy the file, make a duplicate of it, and that'll put it in your drive and you'll be able to edit it. Thanks, Tom. You always got my back. I appreciate it. All right. The next uh, vocab word that's important, it's two cities, okay, along the Silk Road. The first one is Kashgar, and it's located about right here, close to China, okay? It's about maybe like 100 miles outside of China, and this is one of the places that um, travelers would stop for food, water, and trade. Also, ideas are going to spread, okay? It's fun. I'm sorry. How do I pronounce it? I'm so sorry. <laughs> You'll have to teach me because you can't talk to me right now. 
So make sure you teach me, okay? Because I want to say your name right. Two to one. Okay. Tuan? Tuan. Oh, okay. I like that much better. Okay, so Tuan, thank you so much for having my back. You're the best. Love you, kid. All right, so uh, let's see. We've got Kashgar, okay? That is the western edge of China. Travelers stop here for food, water, and trade. Also, ideas and goods are going to spread here, okay? Your next town that's important is Samarkand. This is close to present-day Uzbekistan. It's about, like, right here on our little map that I've got drawn for you up here. And um, this was a stopping point between China and the Mediterranean, okay? So it was kind of like a halfway point for the travelers. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about it? Oh, this is also a really big center for cultural exchange. So think about a flea market. If you've ever been to a flea market, this is kind of what it's like, okay? Just everybody bringing all their wares together and selling them at little booths and also spreading religions. Put down that Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Islam were all present here. Okay, so the presence of these four religions, Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Islam. All right, other things you want to know about the Silk Road. It's established during the Han Dynasty, so it sticks around for a really long time. Because remember, we have the Han Dynasty, and then eventually, when the Mongols take over several hundred years down the road, then the Silk Road is still going on. So, long time, okay? Mostly luxury items are sold. Remember we talked about how luxury items are a status symbol. It's kind of like that bling bling, you know? Everybody wants the status symbol. So, put that down beside your luxury items. An effect, okay? There are a couple of effects that are really, really important. These you could use for SAQ as well as SA, okay? So one effect is the spread of Buddhism. We talked about this when you guys came to the library for the Silk Road. And you should remember this word, syncretism. Let me write it up here for you, just in case you need to spell, know how to spell it. Syncretism. All right? That's important. So what happens is um, syncretism happens to Buddhism. And you should remember how originally Buddhism rejects material goods and also Buddha is not considered a deity or a god, okay? This is how you spell deity. So that's original, okay? But then once it goes traveling on the Silk Road, we have syncretism happening as it spreads. Monasteries are going to be built around where the Silk Road is and merchants are going to come and start giving goods to the monks. And of course the goods want the, the monks want the goods, sorry. And so they kind of start to accept gifts from merchants. So put down originally that Buddhism rejected material goods and that Buddha was not a deity. Then as it spreads, syncretism happens and monasteries along the Silk Road start to accept goods as well as we have a new form of Buddhism that comes out. I'm going to erase this part of our map. I hope you guys got it down. And it is spelled, I want to spell it right, so let me look here. It is spelled like this. Mahayana Buddhism. This is when Buddha becomes a deity, okay? They believe Buddha is a deity or a god, okay? So put that down as a part of the syncretism. All right, how are we doing? Everybody with me? Y'all good? Am I going too fast? Do I need to slow down? Y'all good? Okay, we're going to keep going then. All right, so an effect of the, another effect was the Mongols. All right, so put down under, I think it's number four on your notes, the effect of the Mongols coming into power. They're going to provide security for the Silk Road, and it will thrive under the Mongols, okay? So put that down as well. All right, winging, I'll slow down a little bit for you. So we should have the effect of Buddhism. Make sure you have this down. Then number four is the effect of the Mongols. They provide security. As a matter of fact, when big empires are in charge, that's when the trade routes are going to be most secure. 
Okay. Up next, we have a cultural effect. Cultural effect on the Chinese peasants. So what happens is the Chinese peasants want to spend more of their time and energy producing luxury goods because that's where the money is at. And so they stop farming. And so there will be eventually be a food shortage. Oh my goodness, I can't talk tonight. There will eventually be a food shortage because of this, okay? Because they're not worried about farming as much as make, making luxury items. So put that down as a cultural effect. That should be number five on your notes. Let me take a little drink of water here. All right. Number six, we have diseases transferred. We haven't talked about this yet. But one of these diseases is the dreadful, you guessed it, Black Death. From 1346, I believe. Let me check the date. Yep. 1346 to 1348, half of Europe is killed. What? Yes. Half of Europe killed. from the bubonic plague. And this spread on the Silk Road, okay? Nasty, nasty, nasty disease. You would get like these like boobles, they were called. They are kind of like blisters. And they would be in like the cracks of, like between your arms and your legs and just nasty. And eventually you pretty much just like bleed from the inside out. It was just really gross. They said that the bodies turned black. So that's another reason that they call it the Black Death. Apparently, it came in through Venice off of some ships, merchant ships, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth uh, in a couple weeks. All right, so cultural effect, Chinese peasants, yes, they want to produce more goods, so they stop farming. This is going to eventually cause food shortages. Can I repeat the Buddhism thing again? You can just rewind that, and you'll be able to see it. I think you can rewind a live right away, right? You don't have to wait for me to publish it, do you? Um, and then let's see. Okay, Tawan, great. Thank you for repeating that for me. I appreciate it. You're amazing. Okay. He's a teacher in the making, guys. Teacher in the making right there. All right. So make sure you get down this effect. Okay. That is definitely a big one. Black death. What do we have next? Okay. We have some innovations. I printed some pictures out for you so you can see some, some pictures because, you know, I got this chalkboard. I don't have, like, a TV. I do love my chalkboard, but I was like, it makes it a little bit difficult as a teaching tool because I can't draw all of these. But here's a camel saddle for you. Yeah, camel saddle. You should remember this one because I had one at the Silk Road thing. And uh, it kind of looks like a stool. Basically, it makes it possible to ride camels longer distances. This is what it looks like on a camel. So most of the time they will cover the actual saddle part with blankets and then they hold on to that part right there. Another innovation that we have is a yoke or yoke, yoke I guess. And it goes in between the oxen so that they can pull wagons easier. So that's what that is. Yoke is spelled Y-O-K-E. Another really important innovation, stirrups. This helps you stay on a camel or a horse. Okay, how many of you guys have ever ridden a horse? I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. My parents have horses, so I kind of grew up riding horses. Definitely want to have those stirrups. Riding bareback without a saddle, not so easy. Not so easy. Okay, so those are some innovations. That's the Silk Road in a nutshell. Lots of luxury items on the Silk Road. Remember, we talked about porcelain. We talked about silk. Okay, all these luxury items that can go. And remember, also, the Silk Road is overland on camels, right? Our camel friend here. And so it's a little bit limiting what they can actually take. All right, anybody have any questions about the Silk Road before we move on to Indian Ocean? We all good with the Silk Road? Okay, we are going to focus now on Indian Ocean. That one is right down here in this area. 
It is the red line that I have here on my map, okay? Indian Ocean, some vocab to know. The first one, diasporic communities, okay? I've written that there for you. Let me explain to you what that was and then we'll kind of summarize it a little bit. Basically, sometimes merchants would come from the shores of Africa and they would travel over to India and because the Indian Ocean is basically based around trade winds, okay, monsoon trade winds. And depending on how the winds are blowing, that depends on when you want to go. Because obviously, you want to go when the wind is going to push you faster. Because it'll get your goods to that place faster, especially if you're carrying food or something that could go bad. So, if you're coming from a long distance and you, the winds aren't in your favor to go back, a lot of merchants would stay in India, stay in like the port cities. Sometimes they would marry women there and they would end up living there. And those communities became what was called diasporic communities. That means that they're not living in their homeland. Okay. So for diasporic communities, describe it like this. Put down that sometimes merchants had to wait for monsoon winds to change and blow in the direction that they needed to go. Because of this, Arab and East African merchants would stay permanently in Indian port cities. Sometimes they even married women there and had families. Also important, they are the first to bring Islam to Southeast Asia, into this region right here. So put down that the merchants, the merchants are the first to bring Islam to the shores of Southeast Asia. All right. Now, these settlements that were in India and Southeast Asia are going to be called diasporic communities because when you're away from your homeland, that's known as a diaspora. Okay? Now, another time that you might hear diaspora is in terms of the Jews. We talked a little bit about in my class. I'm not sure if you guys talked about it in your classes or not. But the Jews' homeland was considered the Holy Land, like right here in the Middle East. And they got kicked out, and they went on a diaspora around the world. So basically for a long time until after World War II, the Jews are kind of scattered all over the world. Okay, So that's another reference to that word that you might see. Okay, so make sure that you get down that diaspora means people who are away from their homeland. All right, next up we have Zhang He. Zhang He is an interesting character. You see, I think I got a picture of him. Nope, I don't. Okay, so Zhang He is an Islamic Chinese explorer. He travels through the Indian Ocean. He basically comes down from China this way, travels up into here, kind of does this like exploration. And his purpose was to spread the grandeur of the Ming Dynasty. The Ming were in charge during the time of Zheng He. While he's traveling, he also collects tribute from those that he meets. So like he accepts gifts from them, okay? His fleet at one time contained 300 ships and carried 28,000 people. Like, that's some big ships. Expeditions opened new markets for China to participate in. So his expeditions kind of opened up the Indian Ocean trade route because he was coming around here and realizing, hey, they really have a lot of goods that we want. Okay. Zhang, huh? Really? That's interesting. Okay, I will trust you. Sounds cool. I've always heard it Zhang He, so Zhang Ha. Huh. I like that. That's cool. All right, thank you uh, for letting me know that. Do you speak Chinese, by the way? Anybody on here speak Chinese? Because I definitely mispronounce some Chinese words. I could use your help from time to time. Okay, um, let's see. You do. All right, sweet. I will put you in, in charge of Chinese pronunciation, okay? <laughs> You got to help me out on that one because it's a struggle. The struggle's real, my friend. Maybe you can teach me the secrets of it, okay? All right. 
Um, so anyways, he opens up new markets for China. Okay. And uh, he also kind of like brings about some like rivalries in China. Like there are some people that don't really like the fact that he's going on these expeditions because according to Confucian ideas, the Chinese were supposed to kind of like lead this agrarian um, kind of stable life based on farming. And they kind of worried about outsiders and foreigners. So there were some people that disagreed with him actually going on these trips. They didn't really like it. Okay. Especially elite Chinese. They were somewhat threatened by outsiders. So make sure and get that down. Um, also put down that the elite Chinese look at outsiders as barbarians. Let me put that up here for you. This is kind of interesting because later in history, you'll hear a lot of talk of the Europeans thinking that the Chinese are barbarians and not really wanting to associate with them. But at this point in time, they're thinking that the foreigners are barbarians and they don't want, they don't want to associate with them. Okay, so uh, some advantages. What would some of the advantages of ocean trade be versus the Silk Road or the Trans-Saharan? Why, why do people want to start doing it? Any ideas? Think about traveling on water. You can definitely travel with more and it's faster than traveling on land. Yes. Very good, Tuan. Boats carry more goods, shorten time, speed, take more goods faster. Yes, great. All of y'all are right. That is awesome. Absolutely. So um, that is one of the advantages. Put down that travel by ocean is faster and cheaper, especially because of the monsoon winds. Monsoon, this is how you spell it. The monsoon winds are going to make it really quick. If you go with that wind behind you, you're going to get there a lot faster. Okay, so some of the products. Porcelain comes from China. Y'all should know that because of the Silk Road activity that we did. Also, spices, wheat, sugar. Does anybody know where that comes from? Any guesses? Anybody, anybody? I'll give you a quick minute. Guesses, guesses, guesses. All right, East Asia. So East Asia. Ah, Tuan, yes. We haven't gotten to Champa yet. But yes, that's what we're talking about. East Asia, somewhere near there. <laughs> okay. All right, good stuff. You are doing your reading, kid. I'm so proud of you. All right, so cotton and pepper. That comes from India right here. Okay, so put that down. And then... Ivory and gold comes from Africa. All right. Uh, then we have number three. Uh, this, is, this is made possible by monsoon winds. You might have already written that down. Just put in parentheses beside that that these are predictable winds. Okay. They knew how to predict them and use them to their best advantage. Okay, then we have some innovations. Okay, innovations are always important. First thing we have is the magnetic compass. What's the magnetic compass do, you ask? Well, it helps them to be able to navigate without having the sun visible. All right, so on a cloudy day with the magnetic compass, you can still figure out where you're going. I'm pretty sure, yeah, Ethan, I'm pretty sure that they did call them the Spice Islands. I think that's accurate. I have to look that up and, and verify it, but I'm pretty sure you're accurate about that. Definitely a lot of spices coming from this area of the world. Okay, so magnetic compass, that's our first one. Then we have the astrolabe. This is definitely one to remember. The AP test loves to ask about this one. Astrolabe is uh, basically it enables sailors to calculate latitude, okay? Astrolabe. Enable sailors to calculate latitude. And we have the famous Chinese junks. This is what they look like. This is uh, what some of the ships in Zhang He's fleet would have looked like. They're very large ships. They can carry up to 500 men 
Floss goods. Floss stuff. Floss stuff. And the last thing is the Latin sales. Those are kind of like a skinny sale. I was going to print a picture of that one and I forgot. It's just basically like a skinny sale that helps the ships go faster. Okay. Another important thing with the Indian Ocean is that Venice emerges as an active trade port in the Mediterranean. So Venice is right here on the boot of Italy. And this is the Mediterranean. All right. And so as the goods are coming off the Silk Road, they're going through the Mediterranean and filtering up into Europe. And Venice is an important city uh, for that action. As a matter of fact, that's where they have tracked the ports that let the Black Death in. Okay, so kind of interesting there. Um, let's see, growth of the trade route. One of the reasons that the Indian Ocean grew was because of economic prosperity during the Song and Tang dynasties. So put that down, Song and Tang. So economic growth was attributed to um, their prosperity, okay? The second thing that's important that enabled the Indian trade route or Indian Ocean trade route to flourish is the rise of the Islamic empires. Remember that Islam really, really respects merchants, okay? So as the Islamic empire spread, they're also going to support this Indian Ocean trade. Okay, we got some changes for culture. Uh, leather A is the Shrivija, I think is how you say it. I'm not real sure. Shriv, anyway. Anyway, that kingdom <laughs> comes up and it dominates trade um, because it's in the middle of the Indian Ocean trade route. So they kind of have to go through it to get to anywhere in the Indian Ocean. So just put down that it dominates trade because it's right in the middle of the trade route. And so it kind of springs up and uh, becomes really important. We also have the Swahili city-states. That would be over here on the coast of Africa. These are independent city-states, somewhat like how Greece was when we talked about Greece. Okay, Independent city-states, they have their own king. Put down beside this that an African merchant class rises up. because of this trade route, okay? And because of the trade with India. Some things that they are going to trade out of that region, gold, ivory, slaves, and also put down that Islam will eventually dominate this region. Okay, that's the Indian Ocean trade route. Important things to remember, the monsoon winds kind of make it all possible. Swahili city-states rise up and all of the innovations. Okay, any questions or anything that you missed on that one before we go on? All right, sounds good. Let's do Trans-Saharan trade route. Moving right along. So the first word you need to know is oasis. Basically, these are places where humans can settle because of access to underground water. And I think you got it spelled on there for you. But I'm going to put it up here. Can I spell it right? Yeah. So oases are places where humans can settle because of underground water. And it would basically be in the deserts, okay? Trans-Saharan goes through the Sahara Desert, which is like this area right here, okay? Um, and so we have these oases throughout the uh, Trans-Saharan trade network so that they can refuel their camels. I'm going to scoot this over a little bit. There we go. That way you can see this map a little bit better. All right, here we go. Uh, so put that down for oases. Okay, and then um, the empires that are involved, we have Western Eurasia. So this area right here, it kind of connects Northern Africa. Okay, so the, the Trans-Saharan 
is going to connect Northern Africa with Western Eurasia. Okay. Uh, also, some important kingdoms that rise up. We have Mali in West Africa, about right here. And we know Manza Musa is going to be an important king there. He will eventually become the richest person in the world from this trade route, okay, as a result of this trade route. So his legacy, put this down underneath his name. Uh, this is how you spell it. I can't remember if I put it on your notes or not. Manza Musa, okay? Here's his legacy. He helps connect the West and Northern parts of Africa. So we have uh, West and North. He's connecting this area, okay? The trade route was already in existence before he comes to power, but he increases it and makes it more uh, dominating. He also spreads Islam. And okay, thank you, Tuan. Uh, let's see. Uh, so put down that he, he also spreads Islam. How he does that is by going on a Hajj. Here's how you spell Hajj. Remember, one of the five pillars of Islam is that every Islamic person goes on a pilgrimage or a Hajj at least once in their lifetime. Manza Musa does this, and as he's going, he's spreading Islam. He's also kind of going like this with all his money. And there's documents that talk about how he gives so much money away that he crashes economies in some places because there's too much money in the system. So kind of interesting that he's got that much money that he can just dole it out like that. Um, and so as he's going on his Hajj, he also spreads Islam. That's a part of his legacy. Okay, another important part of this is in Spain. Here's Spain right here. Let me get a different colored chalk here. So the Trans-Saharan kind of connects upwards to Spain. And uh, we have a scholar there, Ivan Rusht. He's a scholar and a philosopher. I think I wrote his name down there for you. Uh, his legacy is that he creates a tolerant society so remember, Islam is more religiously tolerant. They do sometimes make Christians and uh, Jews pay a tax, but they will allow people to not convert to Islam. He also preserves learning and really, really values learning. So you can put that down as well for his legacy. Also part of... The Trans-Saharan, I got a mess over here with my map, so it's kind of hard to see. But the Byzantine Empire is like right in this area, right there. Byzantine Empire, Middle Eastern, it's going to be led by a man named Justinian. And he encourages trade between Asia, Europe, and Africa. So under his reign, trade thrives. And, you know, why would he do that? Well, think about it. Like, the Kai is, like, right here in the middle of everything. So everything kind of has to pass through him. To get down here to the Indian Ocean, to get down here to the African, to get to the Silk Road, Byzantine Empire is right there smack dab in the middle. So, of course, he's going to support that because he's making money. All right, another area that's kind of involved, it would be um, like, I think like right above, like right around this area, Kiev, Rus. This will eventually become Russia. And basically, Vladimir I is the first to convert to Christianity. That's his importance. All right, and he develops the first civilization in Russia and starts spreading Christianity around in that area. Okay. We have some links. Uh, so basically, uh, Trans-Saharan trade route links West Africa with North Africa. So for number one, put down for North Africa, from there we get manufactured goods, cloth, 
glass and books. So Northern Africa, this part right here. I'll say that one more time for you. Manufactured goods, cloth, glass, and books. Then we have Southwest Africa. So like this area right here is mostly going to be agricultural, such as grains and yams. Uh, number three should say something about the Arabian camel. An Arabian camel can go 10 days without water. And so that's really important to be able to go across the Sahara Desert. Okay, you can't do that without that animal. So make sure that you put down that that was vital to crossing the Sahara Desert. All right, we also have some political change. 100 miles. Okay, I'm trusting you on that one because I haven't looked that one up. I know it's big. <laughs> I know it's big, so I'm trusting you on that one, Juan. Okay, so, oh, you got that from the AMSCO book. All right, okay, I see you. I haven't been reading the AMSCO book. I've been reading the Strayer book to review stuff, um, but the AMSCO book is a good one. It's a very good quick reference book. Okay, and I heard Ms. Garza is making you guys do both questions, so, hey. Props to y'all. You'll, you'll be double smart. Okay, so political changes. Let's talk about that for example, uh, for an example. Okay, political changes happen in Mali. All right. Once again, Mali is kind of over in this area right here. Okay. I'm going to erase this because it's kind of a mess. So let's talk about Mali. And we got Africa right here. Here's our kingdom of Mali. Okay. So Mali's rulers unite under one kingdom and begin to monopolize trade. What's monopolize mean again? Do you remember? We talked about it when we did the Silk Roads. Rami, all classes are using AMSCO book. Yes but I use mine for extra credit bonus points sometimes because not everybody has the AMSCO book. So everybody's just kind of using it a little differently. Okay, kind of taking up all the money, yeah. So basically like just having all total control. You're welcome, Ian, I'm glad it's helping. Totally glad it's helping. I don't mind doing these as long as you guys, you know, are getting something from it. Okay, so right, monopoly is control. Okay, so um, the Mali rulers unite the kingdom, monopolize trade, or take complete control. What are they trading? I'm glad you asked. Write down that they are trading horses. Uh, what else? Let's see. Um, metals, salt, and gold. You guys do mine. Where, where are you doing Minecraft? Where are the pep rallies going on? I, I don't know. Did you come in the library and do that? I don't know. You can. If you, you can play it on the big screen if you want. I could hook you up with that. Okay. Um. So we got that from Molly. And then, oh, this is important. This is another part of the political change. A social hierarchy is formed in Molly due to this. Okay. Uh, the social hierarchy. Rulers on top. Then we have merchants. Military. Free peasants. I guess well peasants, right? I always miss, I always like don't want to put too many A's. I don't know. It looks like too many A's. And then down at the bottom, we have, of course, slaves. In between there, you have some religious leaders and some smaller, like, parts of it. But what's really interesting to me is that merchants are right under rulers. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you think merchants are so high up on the list? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Anybody? Anybody? Maybe I'll throw in some extra credit if you can figure it out. Anybody have some thoughts? Spread of culture? 
Whose culture? Ah, very good, Mr. Schultz. Town Schultz has got it because of all the trade, the money. Okay. Um, and so as, um, you know, the rulers want to keep merchants happy, right? Because they want the money from the rulers. So you'll see this in the Chinese society as well that, no, is it the Chinese? No, no, no. The Chinese are opposite. The Chinese put peasants above merchants because food is more important. So it just kind of like goes to show what, um, you know, is important in a civilization. So that's awesome. Uh, Mr. Schultz, or whose class are you in? See if I can work out some extra credit for you there because that was awesome. Okay, uh, Miss Garza. All right, I, I think I can. I think I can talk her into that. I'll, I'll, I'll ask her tomorrow, see what I can do for you. Okay, um, let's see. I think that's, oh, and then um, put down that um, Mansa Musa takes full advantage of this hierarchy, okay? And he becomes really, really rich. As a matter of fact, as you know, richest man in the world, okay? So he's basically like um, taking advantage of all of that. Also, what's the really important city? in Mali that kind of connects with the trade routes. Starts with a T. Anybody know? Do, 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 do. I need one of those Jeopardy things. Yeah, there you go, Ethan. Timbuktu, that's right. Um, Timbuktu and Towns, you got it. Joppa, good job, Timbuktu. I just love that word, it's just fun to say. Uh, so yeah, it's a really important city and um, that's where how they make their money. Okay, uh, that's well, well, that's one of the biggest like trading parts of that area. Okay, and then number five, we also have the Songhai Kingdom or Songhai Kingdom, I think, or Song, I think it's Songhai Kingdom. Um, anyway, they take over after Mansa Musa dies, so they're going to take over Mali after Mansa Musa dies, and we'll talk about them more in the future. But once they take over, they kind of become the powerhouse of Africa, all right, because because of the Trans-Saharan trade route, okay? Everything stems back to that, making money from that trade route. Okay, let's go on and talk about your SAQ. This is the important part, because you may see these questions again, and you guys will have the upper hand. <laughs> All right, so SAQ stands for Short Answer Question. Now, everybody kind of has their own way of teaching this. I've heard a couple of different ways. I've heard the ACE method, all right, which is answer the question, cite some evidence, or, or cite some evidence, and I think this is evidence or examples. Not sure. I like this okay, but I like to tell my students to answer it in a different way. So, I mean, you can answer these in any way you want. This is not wrong. I'm just going with this method. I tell them always put a topic sentence. How are you gonna get your topic sentence? You're basically going to reword the prompt, okay? So put underneath that reword prompt plus your answer. Okay, basically this right here, basically the same thing. I just tell them topic sentence. E is explanation. Okay. You can tell I don't teach it this way. But basically the way I tell them is the same thing anyway. Um, okay, then you're going to explain how it happens, why it happens, and you're going to throw in some vocab words. This is basically those two right there. So basically the same thing. I just find that if students remember how, why, and vocab words, that they get more details in there instead of just saying cite and explain, okay? However you want to remember it, though, be my guest. You are free to remember it however you want, okay? Now, one important thing I want you to make note of, okay? Very important. If the question asks you about change, a change that has happened, got to go back in here. <laughs> if the question asks you about change, this is super important, you need to do two things. You need to describe 
what it's like before the change and after the change. Before and after. This is the only way to show change if you tell before and after the change. The only way you're going to get that point, okay? So keep that in your head. Anytime you're asked about change, you have to say before and after, okay? What it's like before and after. That shows the change process. Okay. So let's practice some of these and see how you guys do. You can use some of the things that we went over tonight. All right, doesn't have to be new information. Your first question is, explain one change brought about by the Silk Road trade, okay? It's your first question. Now remember, change, you have to explain before and after. So anybody wanna to try to write a topic sentence for me on that one? What change could we use? Talked about one tonight, talked about several tonight. What change do you guys want to use? How about we use the spread of Buddhism? So write me a topic sentence for how you would say the spread of Buddhism is our change. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. See if I got some takers here. Write me a topic sentence on how you would describe Buddhism as a change. Anybody? Anybody brave? <laughs> All right. Let me give you an example that I came up with, okay? Oh, wait, wait. We got one. Okay. One change brought about by the Silk Road was the creation of Mahana Buddhism. Okay. Not bad. Here's the problem with that one, though, Towns. Can you really explain that one in depth? Mm, you might be able to say that this gives Buddhism a deity or that it makes Buddha a deity, right? but you're not gonna be able to totally explain it in depth. So how I would change that is just say that brought about uh, the, was the creation, or instead of creation, I would say the syncretism of Buddhism. Then you can talk about Mahana uh, Buddhism. You can talk about um, how they started to accept gifts on the Silk Road at the monasteries. You can talk about more, okay? So very, very good. Just try to make your topic sentence a little less specific so that you can explain more, okay? Tuan says, um, the spread of Buddhism is one of the change brought about by the Silk Road trade. That works, okay? Buddhism changes when it spreads through East Asia by creating Mahana Buddhism. Very good, except for the fact, like I said, that's a little too specific. Make it a little bit more general, like Tuan's, ta Tons. I, I, don't, I still don't think I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> anyway, you can come talk to me tomorrow. Make it a little bit more general like his, okay? Um, and then Rami says, one change that was brought because of the Silk Road trade was spread of Buddhism. Perfect. Tons. Okay. All right. Got you. All right. I definitely owe you some extra credit for mispronouncing your name so much. Okay. Uh, Kevin does not remember this from last year. Well, I mean, you know, we can't be expected to remember everything. <laughs> okay. Just make sure I'm pronouncing it right when you see me tomorrow. Okay. Just make sure I got it. All right. Because I, I hate mispronouncing y'all's names. I want to I want to pronounce them right. All right. So we got one change that occurred because of the Silk Road was the spread of Buddhism. Or you could say the syncretism of Buddhism. Okay. You could also say the spread and syncretism of Buddhism. Either one works. All right. Now we need to write our paragraph. So I would say something like the uh, Buddhism was spread by merchants traveling the Silk Road. Okay. You're basically explaining how it spread. Buddha, Buddhism was founded in India and originally Buddhism was atheistic. Here's how you spell that. Atheistic means that Buddha was not a deity. Okay. And also put down, they rejected material goods. Because remember, we're talking about a change, so you have to write how it changes, so this is before, right? Then you're gonna go into what happens next. However, as it spread, it changed. 
Monks who lived in monasteries along the Silk Road began accepting gifts from merchants. And Buddha becomes a deity in the practice of Mahana Buddhism. Mahayana, sorry. Mahayana. Okay, so <laughs> Kevin, be nice. <laughs> Listen, it's been a long day, okay? I'm super tired. So, and he's not one of my students, so I never had to ask him how to pronounce it. That's my excuse, Kevin. Okay, so uh, <laughs> poor Ton. I'm so sorry. Okay, and it's not Ton. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. I'll bring you a treat tomorrow. Actually, no, we're not in school tomorrow. Oh my goodness, I just remembered. No, you don't want an English name. I love your name. I just got to learn it, okay? Once I learn it, I'll be good to go. All right, let me repeat this one more time. So make sure that you have it, okay? One change that occurred because of the Silk Road was the spread and syncretism of Buddhism. Buddhism was spread by merchants traveling the Silk Road. That's telling me how it spread, okay? Okay. Buddhism was founded in India, and originally it was atheistic and rejected material goods. That's how it was before. Now we have our change. However, as it spread, it changed. Monks who lived in monasteries along the Silk Road began accepting gifts from merchants and, or you don't have to write in, you can just make a new sentence, Buddha also became a deity in the practice of Mahayana Buddhism. So we have the how, we have the before and after of the change. You would definitely get the point for this one. Okay, because you're, you're showing change. Any questions about that one? Okay, look at you guys. You're going to be like SAQ professionals. It's going to be awesome. Okay, next question. Explain one political change in Africa due to the Trans-Saharan trade route from 500 to 1500 CE. Sometimes your questions will have a time frame in it. If it does, put that in your topic sentence when you reword it. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick minute. Look back at your notes over the Trans-Saharan and see if we can ha we have a political change that we can talk about. And let's see. Um, the first person that gives me a good topic sentence. Let's see. Extra credit. Do we want extra credit? Extra credit or maybe like a prize, like some candy or something. We all like candy, right? Maybe I'll make some cookies and bring them in. Who's got a topic sentence for me? Extra credit. All right, extra credit it is. I'll have to talk to your teachers. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll be okay with it. Okay. The Islamic Empire was able to expand its influence. Hmm. Hmm, Kevin, not the topic sentence I'm looking for. For a topic sentence, you need to reword the prompt, right? Ah, here we go. Oh, Towns is bringing it. He says, one political change in Africa due to Trans-Saharan was the co uh, consolidation of the government of Mali. Boom, Towns is just racking up that extra credit tonight. Yes, he is. Let's look and see what Rami has. Ooh, Rami even put, oh, oh, that's eight. Okay, I thought that was a B. I was like, you know, because how SAQs are A, B, C. Anyway, one continuity in the Indian trade route. Oh, you're on the wrong one. I think you're on the next one. Let me see. Yep, you're on the next one. We're looking at political change uh, for the trans-Saharan. Okay, so next we've got one political change in Africa due to trans-Saharan trade route from 500-1500 CE is the rise of Manza Musa and his monopolization of trade. Either one of those would work. It's okay, Rami. We'll save yours for the next time. Next one, okay? All right, so um, 
Rami, just keep that one for the next one. Okay, so political change, very good. We could do consolidation of the kingdom of Mali. Either one you want to do. All right, so let's say that we choose um, the consolidation of the kingdom of Mali. Then within that, you can talk about Mansa Musa. You can talk about what they monopolized. So I would say something like rulers in Mali monopolized the trade of salt, horses, and gold. That gets some vocab words in there, right? Some of those details being very specific. You can even put down a social hierarchy was formed with rulers at the top, followed by merchants, military, free peasants, and slaves at the bottom. Ooh, you could throw Timbuktu in there. And you could say Timbuktu became a large center for commerce due to the Trans-Saharan trade route. During Mansa Musa's rule, he became the richest man in the world due to the wealth from the Trans-Saharan trade route. You could also put in there that his authority as ruler enabled him to increase the size of the empire of Mali. Okay, so you're talking about the how, you're talking about the why, you're giving me some vocab. Kevin, how, what do you mean this is how? I didn't do lives when you were doing your WAP test. Maybe you watched my YouTube videos, maybe that's how. All right, and we got one more question for tonight, and Rami is already on point. He's already got his topic sentence, y'all. Rami, do you remember what your topic sentence was? I think you might have deleted it. Yeah, so you got to put it back up there for them. Okay, so the question is, explain one continuity in Indian trade route from 1200 to 1450 CE. So continuity, something that stays the same, right? Okay, here's Rami's. Uh, yeah, Ethan, continuity, something that stays the same. It continues, all right? Now, the important about continuity, you have to make sure that whatever date they give you, that that thing that you're talking about stayed the same within that date time range, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. All right, so let's see. Rami has one continuity in the Indian Ocean route from 1200 to 1450 CE is the economic prosperity during the Song and Tang Dynasty and the rise of the Islamic Empire. Okay, you got to check your dates on those for sure because... I don't remember. I think the song, I don't know when the song was over. We got to look at the dates on that because uh, you have to make sure that your con continuity is within that area. Okay. Also, you have to be able to talk about that. So um, you could maybe talk about the Swahili city states if you're going to go with the Islamic empire and how like Islam um, uh, helped the merchants spread. Okay. Um, but I would go with one or the other. Don't go with both because you want to, you want to narrow it down a little bit, but you want to make it so that you can talk about whatever you've narrowed it down to. Okay. So since we don't know for sure about the song and Tang, I have to look up those dates. I would go with the rise of the Islamic empire. Okay. And talk about, um, how, because Islamic empire, uh, respected merchants, it kind of gave, prosperity to the Indian Ocean trade route. Does that make sense? Um, another one that you could do is the one that I did for my example is uh, one continuity of the Indian Ocean trade route from 1200 to 1450 was the use of monsoon winds to travel the trade route. Okay. Then you could talk about how they relied on these seasonal winds to take them and their cargo to the trading points or trading ports quickly. Um, trading ports in East Africa were used to transport goods from inner Africa, such as gold and ivory, to India and other Pacific islands. Goods from India, such as cotton, pepper, spices from East Asia, and porcelain from China were transported to East Africa as well. Okay, so that kind of explains how the monsoon winds were predictable and how they helped transport those goods. Okay. So make sure when you're doing your SAQ that you explain the how, the why, the vocab words, throw those in there. And if you're doing a change before and after the change, continuity, something that stays the same, but has to stay the same within that time period. 
Also make sure that you be specific with your topic sentence, but not too specific because you want to make sure that you can explain whatever it is you're writing about, okay? All right, so do you feel like you understand SAQs a little bit better now? I hope that you do. Basically with those SAQs, here's the trick guys, you have to know the information, okay? You can't just make this stuff up. If you don't know it, you don't know it usually. Where are you getting the information? From your reading, okay? Definitely from your reading. Indian Ocean Trade Route, um, yeah, so basically it comes down from China into the Indian Ocean, okay? The monsoon winds, here, I'll draw my map on here a little bit. I can still see it. And we got Africa over here. That's really bad. Uh, but anyway, you get the gist, okay? We got Africa. Here's the Horn of Africa. Monsoon winds are just going to be primarily in the area of the Indian Ocean, okay? Um, but China does get in on this trade because they like to make money, okay? So, yes, trade route would cover or it wouldn't cover it, but it would connect China with Africa. Okay. Yes, Kevin, we are still on SAQs, okay? <laughs> Calm down there, buddy. We're going to be doing some LEQs pretty soon and also some DVQs. Maybe I'll go over those uh, next week when we do our next live. All right, guys. So I hope this was super helpful for you. Um, please stop by the Learning Commons if you have any questions. Um, you can actually, you can absolutely email me anytime. You could also follow on Instagram at Time Machine Teacher and contact me that way. Uh, we are almost to a thousand subscribers. What? What? That's so exciting! So so exciting! Uh, so maybe when we get there, we'll have like a confetti celebration or something. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe like an ice cream party. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Any last questions before I sign off? Thank you so so much for joining in tonight. You are so welcome, Wingy. I'm so excited to have you guys. I really appreciate your support, and uh, I love helping you all. Just want you to be successful and enjoy this class. So you are so, so welcome. 21. <laughs> Two, one? Tuan. 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 Yay, I got it that time, I think. Did I get it that time? Give me a thumbs up if I got it that time. <laughs> Tuan. I'm going to have to remember that. Okay. And um, I love you all very much. Uh, I hope you have a great day tomorrow. Make sure and work on that Mongol trial because it is going to be so, so awesome if all you guys are ready to go. And as always, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe. But I'm sure you guys have because you're awesome. You're like the original Time Machine Travelers right here. All right, guys. I am getting out of here and I will talk to you later. Have a great day off tomorrow. See ya. Oh. Yes. <laughs>